Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Well, thank you, Ian, and uh, thank you to the College for the invitation to uh, give this talk this evening and to discuss with you the uh, long-running question of what killed our national bard and, and, and what did not. Um, just by way of complimenting what uh, Ian Milne has just said, um, Princess Anne and I are just good friends. Um, and um, Rory Bremner is a Scotsman whom I value highly, and William Haig is another man that I value highly because he's a good speaker. And since my retirement from my academic life in medicine you know, three years ago, I've been found myself involved with coaching individuals uh, in our public life, not Haig, who writes his own speeches, but some of our politicians, for example, who um, have uh, not been properly trained, as we were, very lucky to be in, in, in academic medicine, and how to give a talk, how to give a lecture, and how to, uh, how to deal with uh, questions. So let me just uh, uh, recap uh, for you this uh, subject uh, tonight. Some of the images you're going to see in the course of this uh, come from the, um, the great archive, the Scran Archive, which is held by the Royal Commission of Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland uh, here in Edinburgh. Uh, and they are, it is a marvellous archive, 400,000 images of this country's history, her, her geography, geology, the lives of our ordinary people, and in Burns's case, one of our extraordinary people, are held here in Edinburgh and are available for teachers in primary, secondary, tertiary education, scholars, with one proviso. And can the lights be dimmed again, please? The, um, with one proviso, the copyright of these images uh, has been released by their owners to the Royal Commission on one condition, and that the uh, occasion is educational. So, and this is the logo of the Royal Commission, which has to be shown. A marvellous logo, is it not? Depicting this lion sedent, my uh, heraldic friends tell me. Not a lion cushioned or rampant, a lion sedent, and exhibiting ferocity. Although that is what it's supposed to be. I always think that this lion is exhibiting shock. <laughs> and given that this is a male lion, you can see why. <laughs> The, the story of, of the poet's um, disease or diseases or his health and his premature death has been a vexed one down the years. Even some of his greatest supporters and admirers have contributed to, uh, to uh, statements and writings which have tended to deflect us from what probably was actually the case. For example, in his journal, Walter Scott uh, at Abbotsford in 1826, just before the, the, the time of the crash, uh, wrote very movingly, Peace to thy soul, and long life to thy fame, Rob Burns. When I needed a phrase in any of my works for something in which I felt strongly, I found that phrase in Shakespeare or in thee. But he did support his, his son-in-law here. This is John Gibson Lockhart, who, whose biography of Burns in 1838 perpetuated the, um, the story which had begun just after the poet's death that the cause of death was chronic and irreparable alcoholism, and that the poet had probably died of the physical consequences uh, of alcohol. This is John Gibson Lockhart on the right, uh, married to Sophia Scott, the beloved elder daughter of Sir Walter uh, and Charlotte Scott. And the poet's life was a short one. This is, um, this is Boff's famous painting of 1870, depicting the cottage at Alloway, where our poet was born on a wild winter's night in January 1759 um, to William Burns, a small farmer, and his wife Agnes, a farmer's daughter from Maybole, which is about five miles down the road as you're looking at it here. My own family home being just three miles the other way um, on the junction of Prestwick and Ayr. So I remember this well from childhood. And the poet was born here and died 37 years later of untreated what? rheumatic fever, brucellosis. We shall have a look at the evidence for both of them. He died here. This is the, an old uh, engraving of Burns's house in the town of Dumfries, 
um, now, now known as Burns House, and the street is known as Burns Street. And this is his final home, and was his final home for three years, from 1793 uh, until his death. And in this house, his widow, Jean Armour, lived on for 38 years. She never remarried, her, her widowhood lasting one year longer than the poet's life itself. And four days after his, uh, his death, uh, to the accompaniment of a uh, 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 military band and uh, the accompaniment of between 10 and 15,000, we understand, uh, citizens from all over southern Scotland, the poet was buried. And from the medical point of view, in that intervening four days, there was no post-mortem. Any speculation or any assertion of what killed our poet has to be speculated and based on secondary evidence, because there was no post-mortem and we do not and will not have a tissue diagnosis. Yes, oh yes, and one other point about the funeral. Um, the, the, as I say, the only image that we have of it, this is the mid-steeple in Dumfries here, and here's the cortege um, carried by his comrades in the, um, the battalion, the Dumfries volunteers. Little realised, even in Scotland, that Burns died a serving soldier. He was a member of the Royal Dumfries volunteers, what would be a a home guard regiment raised in the 1790s all over the country uh, for the home defence, the regular army being deployed in our post-revolutionary wars with, with France. And they advanced down the, um, the, the street uh, to his burying in St Michael's uh, Kirkyard. His wife was not there. She was in labour. In the very day that uh, the poet was being carried to his interment in St Michael's Kirkyard, Jean Armour was giving birth to the last of their nine children. Uh, she was, the boy was called Maxwell, after the physician who had looked after Burns in his terminal illness. Um, and uh, he was being born, literally, as his father was being born uh, to, his, uh, to, his, uh, to his rest. Up country in Dumfrieshire, uh, a man lived who was an artist. And the last image we have of the poet before his death uh, was from, from John Reed here. And this is Burns as he was last seen, or at last represented by any, in any art form. This is between 10 and 11 months before his death. Now you cannot make a diagnosis from a painting. You cannot uh, induce anything uh, of any clinical value from this. All I would say to you is that it doesn't look like a man about to die. It doesn't look like a, a man who is... Uh, uh, almost terminally ill, and yet the illness which was to slay him uh, was beginning to affect him at this time in 1795. Burns himself wrote to a friend that this was a very good image and re regards me particularly as I am in life, making no comment in that letter about any illness. You can actually see the, the uh, colours of his waistcoat here. This is interesting too. The poet, the poet was a radical. The poet cannot be placed into any contemporary political uh, compartment. You can't call him a, a conservative or a Lib Dem or a, or, or a socialist. He was a radical of the time. He was a Foxite Whig and very much opposed to the Tory government of the day. And he wore his colours on his chest. And these are the buff and the blue uh, of the colours of the Whig party. The buff and the blue colours themselves deriving from the uniform of General George Washington in the Revolutionary War strongly supported uh, by, by the poet. And the problem with the diagnosis began almost immediately. Here is the evening paper as it was um, in the uh, late 18th century. And it was in this paper, the Edinburgh Evening Current, which evolved through many evolutions into the uh, our present evening paper, that the obituary appeared. And that started the hair running, because that obituary unsigned by a brave man who knew that Burns's pen had fallen silent. This brave man uh, pointed out that the poet had died effectively of alcoholic poisoning. Useless to his friend and his family was the phrase. And that stuck. That really did stick because there were for many reasons as, we, as we'll see later. But it was then perceived here in Edinburgh and then throughout Scotland that the poet uh, had died of his addiction, of addiction to alcohol. And this was then reinforced four years later with the first biography. And this is one of our colleagues. 
This is the first biographer of Burns, whose four-volume biography uh, appeared in 1800, four years after the poet's death. This is James Curry, MD, FRS, uh, who was engaged by the Burns family. Uh, very sadly, Dougal Stewart, the poet's uh, friend and patron and professor of philosophy at the University of Edinburgh, was approached but declined, to the tremendous regret of scholars ever since, to write the biography of Burns. He was just too busy with his academic work at the university. And this man, who did not know Burns, who had only seen him once, who was a physician and a reformed alcoholic from Liverpool, uh, engaged, was engaged by the family to write the biography. In his defense, it must be said that he was a reformed alcoholic, that he pursued data assiduously, and that the profits from the book were not retained by him, but were devoted to the to the uh, support of Jean Armour and the six Burns children with which she had been left. No child, by the way, over the age of 10 in the family after the poet's death. Curry's book was published, as I say, in 1800. The works of Robert Burns with an account of his life, criticism of his writings, and unsaid criticism of the poet himself. Because throughout the book there is this undertow of accusation that it was alcoholism that was his undoing and ultimately um, his, his fate. Part of the reason for that, of course, was the nature of his works. Um, drink in its various forms features strongly in many of his best works. The Jolly Beggars here, for example, from his early days in the village of Mochlin uh, in Ayrshire, describes these these randy gangrel bodies, as he describes them, uh, holding their splore in Pussy Nancy's tavern, fueled by, by alcohol. And of course, the great narrative poem, Tam O'Shanter, um, has a rather tipsy farmer um, leaving the market in air and heading home uh, to the southern part of Ayrshire over the Dune River, interrupting the witches, of course, at their Sabbath and uh, being pursued. Drink appears again and again in the poet's work. But was it, does that mean that it was a problem for the poet himself? We will find, I think, that he was no teetotaler, but he was by no means the alcoholic which he was painted to be immediately after his death. And still to this day, in parts of Scotland, you will find men and women who truly believe that the poet was slain by drink. Those of you who know the south of Scotland will recognize this aerial shot of the Crichton. This is the Crichton campus, as it is now, of the University of Glasgow. And it was the birthplace of this man. And this is a man whom we should all admire in the sense that, not just for his tremendous whisker, uh, but, but also for his uh, medical science. He, this is Sir James Crichton Brown, um, who was born in uh, De Vries, great admirer of Burns. His, his middle name derives from the fact that his father, uh, also James uh, Brown, was the first medical superintendent of the Crichton Royal Hospital in Dumfries, which certainly in my lifetime, when I was a young man uh, in Ayrshire, um, was a major centre for psychiatric and social rehabilitation. And this man, Crichton Brown, displayed uh, the classic medical investigative talents which we teach to our medical students. In other words, you take the evidence and you apportion your belief to the quality of the evidence. And like all his generation as a youngster, Crichton Brown was rather sad that Burns had died of, um, of alcohol, as was generally believed at the time. And then doubts began to rise. Here's this good scientist who said, interesting, isn't it, that a man who is a hopeless alcoholic is producing high quality poems and songs right up to the time that death took the pen from his hand. That doesn't sound like the normal course of events for a hopeless alcoholic who's, and when there are plenty of them in the history of literature, the, there's a, usually a downward trend of falling off in quality and quality uh, before the end. And also he's, he said uh, there are other evidences which he would like to lead. And he began, he began the revision process of examining the diagnosis of alcoholism to see if it would stand up. And he was a good scientist. Just by the way, he was not just an MD, but an, FR, an FRS. His, um, um, his application for um, uh, fellowship of the Royal Society 
being proposed by Charles Darwin, Darwin himself. And he was a great Darwinian, uh, James Crichton Brown, and uh, he would have enjoyed this. I think this is a marvellous image of the, the, the postage stamp <laughs> commemorating Darwin uh, being examined by uh, our nearest cousin. Our nearest cousin. I may just go sideways for a moment. Uh, here at the college, it reminded me in, inevitably of a college meeting in London at the Royal Society, which I co-organised on this subject with the, the President, um, Lord Salisbury, the Royal Society of Medicine. And uh, we, had a, uh, we had Darwinism from dawn till dark, except for one lecture from the Archbishop of York, who gave the theological church view of evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, but he did point out in his, his remarks to this meeting of medical scientists, geologists, and uh, philosophers, wonderfully um, eclectic meeting, that he had heard, this is the Archbishop, the, my Lord Archbishop, saying he, he was delighted to be speaking today at the Royal Society because it was just last week, he said, that we had the final DNA analysis showing that we are 98.5% homologous in our DNA with the chimpanzee. And then to the astonishment of the, of the gathering, he said, this means, if I may speak um, um, uh, reflectively, that um, given that the soul is part of the body politic, and given that the body politic is in, established by the DNA, and given that we share 98.6% of our DNA with the chimpanzee, this means that the chimpanzee probably has a soul. And therefore it strikes me that if that is the case, then the care and maintenance of that soul, its welfare, might become a legitimate charge on the Church of England. <laughs> well, you can imagine how this was received by the masked skeptics and the president. And, but I had invited the press to the meeting. And uh, his, his, my Lord Archbishop did not produce any consensus for these interesting speculations. But he did produce the next morning the most wonderful headline in the Daily Telegraph's report of the meeting, which was, chimpanzees have souls, says primate. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, here's another Darwinian, this is the James Crichton Brown, who asked the first clinical question, why was it if Burns died of alcoholic poisoning and, and chronic alcoholism and presumably of liver failure, why was he not jaundiced? We all know the evolution, and it was known in his time, the evolution of the pathology of the of hepatocellular function with progressive uh, alcoholic attack. And repeated observations of the poet in his last days did made no mention of any uh, jaundice, uh, uh, any discoloration which might have suggested it. And again, this was beginning to reinforce Crichton Brown's suspicion that the diagnosis might have to be modified. And this is Burns's. Um, uh, nurse in her last illness, and she was the lady consulted um, by, by Crichton Brown meticulously as to her observations of him, his symptoms and signs, as much as this intelligent, non-untrained lady uh, could report. She was actually the, the recipient of his last great song. Wert thou in the cold blast in yonder lee, and yonder lee, my plady to the angry ert eyed shelter thee. Almost within four or five days of his death. And again, Crichton Brown thinking, well, is this the behavior of somebody slain by alcohol? And then the other piece of evidence came to light with this. The poet was an exciseman. He was an officer of the Scottish Excise Service, the forerunner of our beloved Inland Revenue. And he had been for five years. And again, Crichton Brown asked the question, how is it that a man who is doing a job calling for meticulous attention to detail, a very complex business being an exciseman. Taxation, uh, we should remember, was at source in those days. There was no VAT where you, you paid when you bought. You paid when you manufactured. And there was a very complex range of, of duties and excisable charges on tallow, on candles, on, on, uh, on leather. All had to be uh, applied by the excise officers. And these are, this is one of the books for the collectors of excise in, in, in this country, uh, dating from before Burns' time in 1707. This is Burns' measuring stick. He had to measure barrels and calculate tax uh, to be applied to alcoholic drinks, for example. And it was a dangerous game. This is his, uh, his personal weapon. I used to think, and uh, I used to say publicly, that this, 
uh, was his musket. Um, and uh, you can see the very heavy ball uh, that it threw. Uh, but it's not a musket. And I was corrected by my, my soldier son, who's a member of the parachute regiment, that said, Daddy, this is not a musket. This is a carbine. And I inquired what the difference was and was, was told, you can actually see the, the muzzle of the weapon within this shot. It's a very short barreled close range weapon. Burns had to be armed and ready to defend himself and his other excise officers from smugglers who in those days were armed, full of fight and knew what would happen to them if they were taken. And the, uh, so he was involved with an extremely complicated uh, and meritorious service. Promotion was by merit. And that was another thing that really affected the, uh, uh, the, the considerations of, um, uh, uh, of Sir James Crichton Brown. Because Burns, it's very difficult. This is not transposed well. I'll, I'll just leave that one. He was marked down by his superiors. This is John Syme uh, from Dufrice, his superior in the excise, for promotion to supervisor. And that did it for Crichton Brown. Promotion to supervisor was very carefully uh, controlled and very, very greatly sought. Uh, and Crichton Brown then asked the question, how is it that a hopeless alcoholic is marked down for promotion in a meritocratic service when we all know the fate of alcoholics, which is demotion and dismissal? And with that, he went public and said, no, the poet was no teetotaler, but it was not, whatever it was, it was not alcohol that killed him. And indeed, uh, John Syme here, the um, supervisor in, for Dumfrieshire of the excise, uh, wrote a formal report which was then discovered, saying that Burns was an assiduous and a, a, a careful, a meticulous officer, highly regarded by his colleagues and by his superiors. Hardly the report uh, of an alcoholic. And thanks to the FBI in America last year, we, we were able to, to scan back the two very old paintings of his wife. Uh, we regressed, thanks to these uh, remarkable uh, uh, software um, uh, programs in, in the United States, the two paintings of Jean Armour as an old woman to as she, this, as she was, as, as we think she was, uh, when she married Burns. And her own testimony, Jean Armour's testimony, uh, was that the poet was not in any way incapacitated. Do, do come in and have a seat. There's one at the front here. Was never incapacitated by alcohol in the time that she had known him. No teetotaler, but in, when she also confirmed the absence of one of the key symptoms of alcoholism, which is drinking at home in the morning. And we were all taught as medical students, and we all know that the classical sign of alcoholism is drinking alone and drinking especially in the morning. Burns never did that, and his wife and his superiors and his neighbours attested that uh, he confined his uh, enjoyment of the grape and the grain to the evening social hour with friends and never let it intrude upon his domestic responsibilities at home or his professional duties uh, to the excise. And here is one of the treasures of the archive, another lady who, uh, who reported uh, as I've just said, on his behaviour, which did not fit with the general uh, uh, feeling of the time, which had come from these obituaries and Curry's biography. This is one of the great treasures in our archives. There are no photographs of Burns. He was dead long before photography arrived, but he was the eldest of the family and died young. The youngest of the family, of the seven of them, uh, seven siblings, was Isabel, who died old. And in 1743, our first great uh, artist in the new genre of photography, David Octavius Hill, Secretary of the Royal Scottish Academy here in Edinburgh, uh, he and his technical assistant, Robert Adamson, boarded the brand new railway train in 1843 at Haymarket Station, long before Waverley was built, crossed to Glasgow, went down on the newly constructed line to Ayr, hired a carriage, went to Alloway, found her and <coughs> shot her on her, in bright sunshine, in her, uh, 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 at her cottage door. You are looking not at a, an engraving or a painting, you're looking at a posed photograph of Robert Burns' wee sister. She was 72 years old at the time, she lived another 10 years, and uh, she looked very like him when she was young, we are told. And this is the only chance we might have to know what the poet might have looked like 
had he lived and had he not died of whatever it was. One final uh, piece of evidence came from the, the rector here. Burns was an honorary Burgess of Dumfries, and that carried with it the <coughs> rights and privileges to have his sons educated at Dumfries Academy. And when the, uh, the story began to circulate about from Curry's biography about the, the alcohol problem, there was an immediate response from James Gray, the rector of Dumfries Academy. And we have his letter. Uh, sent to, to Peterkin here in Edinburgh, James Peterkin, saying, where is this coming from? It's a wonderful letter. Who says he was an alcoholic? I had the privilege of educating his sons. In the five years he lived in Dumfries, I saw him almost every day, and never once in that experience did I observe him affected by alcohol. Tell me, Mr. Peterkin, who is saying this? Tell me the man. And this was the general response from his colleagues in Dumfries. So what was it then? Something happened here. We're now back in Ayrshire. We're now back, he's now back to be 21 years old. This is Lochley, uh, Lochley Farm near the village of Turbolton, which was the uh, second farm occupied by the Burns family when uh, the poet's father, William Burns, was still alive. And here he was a young, this is where he grew up and was as a young man having his first forays into, into writing, into prose and, uh, and poetry. And he left the farm um, in 1781 to try his hand at flax dressing. Flax was then being tested out on the fields of Ayrshire and across Scotland. And this is Irvin, as it was, by the River, River Irvin, in 1781. And the poet lived here in the Glasgow Vennel in, in, uh, in Irvine uh, to be trained in the art of flax dressing. It's a complicated process, and I, I myself am no, no master of it. But it's an interesting problem, and there is a condition called bisonosis, where the inhalation of, uh, of particulate material from the flax can cause an allergic reaction similar to asthma, and in fact in chronic form can cause uh, a pneumoconiosis. We just wonder what it was. Maybe that had something to do with it. But he certainly fell ill. And half a century ago, there was discovered the daybook of the physician and we would say now general practitioner in Irvine. His name was Charles Fleming. We find his daily book was discovered in the mid-1950s and in it, very interestingly, he attended a Robert Burns, a flax dresser, age 22, five times he saw him from the 4th to the 14th to the 22nd November 17th. This was the poet. And to his eternal shame, <laughs> Charles Fleming did not say in his daybook, what his presumptive diagnosis was. It does not appear to the considerable fury of Burns's later biographers and to the, to the shame of we, uh, Dr. Fleming's uh, uh, colleagues. But he attended this young man five times. He must have been quite ill to have five visits over that period of time from the, uh, from the local physician. But what was it? All we can do is at second hand look at what he gave him what the treatment was applied to Burns. The pepaquana, an emetic, was given, and this is recorded in Fleming's daybook. He was given what was known as sacred elixir, which was a purgative, rhubarb and aloes and other uh, constituents. So he was to be purged and um, given uh, an emetic to make him vomit. He was given an anodyne. Uh, we are not sure what that was, possibly laudanum. And he was given cinchona, derived from the bark, uh, which we now know the, the actor principle to be quinine. Quinine had not been identified at that time. It was just known that uh, this bark was somehow uh, useful in, in absorbing fe uh, for fevers, for, as an antipyretic to reduce fever. So the patient um, was fevered, he was in pain, and he, it was, he, had well, he was uh, given an emetic and a purgative, which is probably a general approach in those days to almost everything. Uh, purgation was thought to be a major uh, 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 therapeutic approach. The aforesaid, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the, the letter of Burns uh, was to the uh, fellow of this college, to James Gregory, who invented the dreaded Gregory's mixture, which contained rhubarb, aloes, and various other things. 
had an internal effect about seven on the Richter scale. And uh, incidentally, uh, he died a very rich man, did uh, James Gregory for his, his, pur his purgative, which was given to generations of helpless Scottish school children for everything, from headache to athlete's foot. Um, uh, Gregory's mixture was prescribed, and he died a very wealthy man. He also uh, uh, received our sort of grumbling uh, admiration. He had invented a cure for which there was no disease. <laughs> but here's, the, here's what happened to, to, to Burns. This was the, what was prescribed for him. I can just remember from my earliest days in studying Materia Medica as a, an undergraduate at Glasgow University, very strongly uh, uh, used. Sacred Elixir uh, turned out to be also a strong purgative. And here, here is the, uh, here is the, uh, the constituent uh, of it and the instructions for, uh, for preparing it from the Edinburgh uh, Pharmacopoeia of 1770, and therefore probably in use uh, in Burns's time. And of course the St. John of Bark from the, uh, from the tree producing quinine which was uh, given to him. So that's what was given to him. That was what we can only surmise from that, what might have been going through Dr. Fleming's mind. And we can come back to that in discussion afterwards. The ruling diagnosis at the moment, or the, the one which is held centre stage, is this. Rheumatic fever. For the, for the non-medical members of the audience, this is a streptococcal disease um, induced with, beginning with an acute pyrexia, sore throat, but having major complications elsewhere. And uh, back from my, my, my undergraduate teaching days, to, this is just to remind all of us that the manifestations of acute rheumatic fever are a polyarthritis, that is pain and inflammation in multiple joints, carditis, inflammation of the heart, the endocardium and the myocardium, erythema marginatum, which is a skin rash, chorea, which is uncontrollable inappropriate movements, and certain subcutaneous nodules. Was this the acute disease that Burns had? That was the conclusion of Watson Buchanan, who wrote a very interesting paper on the subject for the Scottish Medical Journal some time ago. And here's the erythema marginatum in a young uh, patient suffering from uh, acute traumatic. This is what it might have looked like uh, had it, this affected Burns. And also cardiomegaly, or in enlargement of the heart. Here's a standard Posture anterior chest x-ray with the, uh, the lung fields in, in dark on both sides. And here is an enlarged heart. Uh, normally the, the heart shadow will be approximately 50% of the width of the thoracic cavity. You can see immediately that this heart is more, is occupying more than 50% of the total width. And this patient is suffering from cardiomegaly, which just means enlargement of the heart consequent to rheumatic fever. I have no idea why this slide is here, ex <laughs> except it must have become inserted uh, uh, eccentrically. It's the two dogs, this is actually from Burns' um, uh, his first uh, book uh, of poems, the Comarnic Edition. The first poem in the book is The Two Dogs, uh, the Newfoundland uh, hound here, the, the Laird's dog, having a wonderful discussion with the, with the farmer's collie, uh, shown here on the right. Oh, yes, I know, yes, I remember, it might have had some relevance. You can get brucellosis from a dog. There's a brucella canis. And that's to lead into the, to the fact that there's another possibility uh, raised by some of our colleagues over the years, and that it might not have been rheumatic fever, and the consequences of rheumatic fever, which we'll come to later, but it might have been this. It might have been the fact that he was a farmer. He might have picked up a, an infection uh, which is not unique to, but common among agricultural workers. Burns, of course, uh, working in the fields with animals alongside him, in very close proximity to, uh, to animals, plowing, actually plowing up the mouse here um, in this uh, bas relief, uh, the famous mouse that he plowed up in the fields of Mosgiel Farm, his last farm in Ayrshire, uh, when he uh, uh, disturbed her nest and the mouse scuttled away and the poet then reflects on the relationship of the, the vanity of human wishes. But Musi, there are no lane, and thinking forsecht may be vain, the best laid schemes of oh mice and men gang after glai, and leave us nocht but grief and pain for promised joy. But farm animals 
carry a certain bacterium, and this is it. This is Brucella. Various sorts of Brucella. The main one is Brucella melitensis from goats and sheep. There is a Brucella abortus, uh, which can, is, is obtained from cattle. Uh, Brucella melitensis here, because it, melitensis because it was first uh, desc described in the island of Malta. Um, Brucella canis, as I've mentioned, the, from, from dogs. And Brucella suis uh, from swine. Each of these uh, organisms can infect uh, workers working with these animals and the symptoms are very similar to those of which Burns complains as he describes in his letters and in descriptions about him. Incubation period is quite variable from five days to three months. Patient complains of malaise, lethargy, headache, muscle pain, myalgia, especially backache, fever and chills and Burns repeatedly uh, complains of episodes of these, um, this set of symptoms throughout his, throughout his life. In the later stages, we get weight loss, which he certainly suffered, abdominal pains, headache, backache as before, weakness, irritability, insomnia. Again, some of these would fit with the complaints which he describes in his letters. In the very late stage, interestingly, you can get abscesses in the liver or in the, um, in the spleen um, and the uh, and their inflammation and involvement also of the heart, the central nervous system and the skeleton. And this is interesting here. I didn't actually, I had forgotten from my undergraduate days that uh, brucellosis can cause endocarditis, which is an inflammation of the inner lining of the heart. And that was a very important one to discuss, which we'll, we'll come to a little later. So brucellosis in all its phases would fit um, with the evolving symptoms and signs of which Burns complained. We can test for it now easily. Our laboratory uh, technicians can pick it up very quickly. We can culture it and, uh, and we can treat it. But not then. But the heart may have been at the heart of the matter. It may well be that the problem was, in fact, rheumatic fever. And the, the particular complication which should uh, concern us now is the complication of heart disease or rheumatic heart disease, um, which is often the terminal event uh, in chronic uh, 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 rheumatic involvement. And oops, there's the, um, here is the, again for our, for our non-medical colleagues here, this is a, a section through the heart. Here's the left ventricle, the main pumping chamber of the heart. And blood comes into the left ventricle through this valve. It's called the mitral valve. And if it is, if it is thickened and, uh, st or as we say, stenosed, narrowed, the patient often will complain of irregular heartbeat and often waking up at night with a tremendous sensation of shortness of breath. And Burns describes this. We call it paroxysmal nocturnal uh, uh, dyspnea. Shortness waking up thinking that they're choking, that they're about to suffocate. Burns repeatedly describes this, and it's a classic symptom of rheumatic heart disease of patients suffering from mitral stenosis. And the blood then leaves the, after when the heart contracts, the blood is fired out of the heart through this valve, the aortic valve, into the first great artery of the vascular system, the, the aorta. And sometimes this valve may become stenosed, or narrowed, or thickened. And this may or may not have been what affected uh, the port. But the consequence of this, of, the, of this affection of the heart, um, is infection of the heart. And what often happens is that an infection somewhere else in the body uh, releases into the bloodstream bacteria. A classical one is apical root abscess, dental abscess here. And in his last uh, year of life, the poet complained bitterly and wrote a poem about uh, the toothache, addressed to the toothache. Apical root abscess and the absence of dentists was a nightmare for the patient in, in former times, as, as this engraving uh, uh, illustrates. And the apical root abscess is a classic route of in ingress of bacteria from the abscess into the bloodstream and to the damaged heart. And when these bacteria arrived at the damaged heart, the rheumatic heart, this would happen. Inflammation, the bacteria would engraft onto the valves or into the inner lining of the heart. Endocarditis, inflammation of the inner lining of the heart. And this is what 
is generally thought to be the front runner of the diagnosis of what killed him. We have a letter from Burns to, um, to one of his great patrons, Mrs. Dunlop of Dunlop, a lady of the gentry, a direct descendant of, the, uh, uh, of William Wallace. She was born Francis Wallace in Ayr and claimed direct descent from the Scottish patriot who was uh, executed in London just outside the uh, outpatient department of St. Bartholomew's Hospital in 1306. Burns to Mrs. Dunlop um, on the January the 31st, um, 1796. He has six months to live. Lately I have drunk deep of the cup of affliction. Last autumn robbed me of my only daughter and darling child, and at a distance... He was in Dumfries, the child was at Mochlin with his, 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 uh, his in-laws. Um, the autumn robbed me of my darling child so rapidly as to put it out of my power to do my last duties to her. I had scarcely begun to recover from that shock when I became myself the victim of a most severe rheumatic fever. He dis this is the very words that the poet uses. And long the die spun doubtful, the die is the, uh, the dice, spun doubtful until after many weeks of a sick bed, it seems to have turned up, that is, turned up for life rather than the alternative. And I'm beginning to crawl across my room and once, in, once indeed now have been before my door in the street. Very severe illness afflicted him. And that has been conjectured to be the, uh, one of the first uh, attacks of endocarditis. Uh, subacute, that is, not terminal, but and coming on slowly rather than immediately. And they sent him here. He was sent for treatment for whatever it was here. This is, you're looking south across the Solway. Here is the Dufrisha shore here. Here is the Solway at low tide. And in the distance, the mountains of Cumbria over the border in England. And his physician uh, sent him here because the treatment for his paroxysmal attacks and his fever and all his symptoms was to go up to his neck in the freezing waters of the Solway three times a day and to drink the appallingly tasting waters of a calibiate stream and spring at a place called the Brow Well, which is south of, just south of Dumfries, near Annan on the, on the Solway bank. And loyally obeying his doctor's instructions, Burns waded out into the Solway three times a day uh, to uh, immerse himself in cold water and uh, to also to drink the waters of the spring. He didn't consult his two medical friends, very sadly. In retrospect, he should have got himself to Edinburgh, hopefully at least to get a diagnosis or to see the best medical opinion of the day. This is uh, Lang Sandy Wood, who, a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons, our sister college across the town, who was a friend of Burns and a patron of Burns, very, very tall, very fine surgeon. He looked after Burns when he uh, dislocated his knee in a carriage accident when he lived in Edinburgh. And this man, who was the, uh, uh, the recipient of the letter, which I mentioned earlier, which we published this very week, James Gregory, a member of a very famous uh, family of academic Gregories, professor of medicine here, president of this college, and friend and patron of the poet. The poet's copy of the great orations of Cicero, which he so admired, uh, was given to him as a present by, by James Gregory. But neither he nor, or, nor Alexander Wood knew of the poet's illness. He was only consulted by a local, uh, only consulted a local physician and GP and died here in, the, uh, in his uh, bedroom at the house in Dumfries on the 21st of July, 1796. And this is the only image which the, the nation has of the, of the procession entering the, the kirkyard of St. Michael in De Vries, where, where he lies to this day. He was the cradle in which uh, uh, Maxwell Burns was placed just after his father's interment. And in a, a touch of irony, in a sense, uh, it was to be 80 years from Burns's death in, uh, in 1796 before another boy would be born in Ayrshire. Another farmer's son, who would make a mark in the world. And this, of course, is Alexander Fleming, 
who was to discover the penicillin with which today we would treat uh, endocarditis. And the port lies here in a mausoleum erected uh, in the kirkyard uh, of St. Michael. And his wife beside him and his children. And there's the key. This is the key to the mausoleum itself. Uh, but what is the key to the diagnosis? We're not sure. We'll never be entirely sure. But I think it's most important to try and remove the canard and the hair that was started running all those years ago. And I would challenge any man uh, alive today to come to this podium and advocate that drink played a part in it. I think he had a systemic disease. I think he had an infection. He might just have had a cancer. The symptoms and signs would be consistent with a very rapidly evolving malignancy. But again, without a tissue diagnosis, uh, we cannot know. But he lives on. And my friend Sheena Wellington here uh, those of you who heard it, I'm sure, will not forget it, sang his great anthem for the common man. A man's a man for all that, uh, famously at the opening of the Parliament in, in 1999. So there you are, in, in fairly brutal summary, is a synopsis of what we know and what we don't know about what might have, uh, have taken our port from us at the age of 37 years. Three great Roberts in the history of this town of literature, Burns, Ferguson and Louis Stevenson. Not one of them lived beyond 45, Stevenson being the oldest in death. Had they lived their span, we would have had a hundred years of output of the three of them together. To, suspect, to speculate as to what they might have produced would be idle and profitless. But it is a pity that he was taken at the height of his powers, but he did leave us the most remarkable output, 368 songs, 400 poems, 710 letters, until Tuesday, 711 now. <laughs> A remarkable output in just 12, not, not 37, but 12 years. Name another writer who is not a full-time writer, who could produce anything like that output, and tell me that that is con consistent with a man who is a slave to drink. I think it was endocarditis. That's a personal view, and your own will be, will be most welcome. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the introduction and for your attention. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk slash heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.